Glory Cotton Bowl and site of the Red River Shootout between the Oklahoma Sooners and the Texas Longhorns. ESPN's College Game Day starts now. There is nothing more red-blooded than the Red River rivalry. Today, a test of Texas heart, of hunger born from humiliation. It is neighbor against neighbor, namesake against namesake. It is validation day for the Longhorns legend in the making. I call him the Golden Child. People believe I got too much hype, and, and uh, I'll be the first one to tell you that I probably, I definitely did. Hype is growing for Grossman as the mighty Gators face wounded but dangerous LSU. No retreat, no surrender, baby. It's going down here tonight. In the shoe tonight, Kustak and the Cats must conquer Northwestern's nemesis. That and more on College Game Day from Big D next. College Game Day is presented by Discover Card, proud sponsor of college football's premier pregame show. Well, howdy from the Texas State Fair, the ground surrounding the Cotton Bowl. Over the years, everybody from FDR to Gorbachev have come here. You can buy a prize hog, a hot tub, you can eat yourself a corny dog, and you can watch a real good football game every year. Chris Fowler, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreit. I want to thank Big Tex. Yep. Very good. Big it's October, Lee, and that's good news for these folks, and it's also good news for Bob Davey, and he needs some. Now, you're not kidding now, Chris. You know, Notre Dame is dead last in the NCAA in scoring offense. 7.7 points per game. That's not good. But I think they beat Pittsburgh today, and I think they win enough games to go to beautiful downtown Orlando and that new Tangerine Bowl. Now, I'm interested to see which Texas team shows up today. The one that got embarrassed 63-14 to 14 last year, which happens to be the worst defeat in this 100-year history of the game, or the new Texas team that rallied and won 11 and out of the next 12. Kirk, I'll tell you what. The Texas fans and the players, they better be ready to back up that no mess with Texas. You're starting early. No I like to see Texas. that. You're giving a little bit of a lean here. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. A couple other games today. Rare primetime game on ESPN for the Big Ten fans. Northwestern Ohio State, great opportunity. And I think Big Ten fans will get a chance to see why the SEC has fallen in love with that window. Two other teams to keep an eye on. Kind of surprising starts. Iowa and Washington State. Now today they're going to face tougher challenges. Iowa goes on the road to face Purdue. Washington State hosts Oregon State. Can you imagine these two teams continuing? Maybe 5-0 and after today. That's a big surprise. Add to that in Maryland. They yep. haven't beaten yep. Virginia in a long time. If Ralph Friedman gets that win, he goes back to Georgia Tech at 5-0. and Couple top 10 teams on upset alert today on the road. Oregon at Arizona, Virginia Tech against West Virginia, and Washington home against USC needs to be careful. Number two, Florida, off a very emotional win, has probably its toughest road test. It's a matinee in Baton Rouge, and less inebriation there means less intimidation at Tiger Stadium. That's where the very sober Tony Barnhart begins our roundup. Tony? After last week's loss to Tennessee, LSU faces a must-win situation today against Florida. But there's a problem. LSU's pass defense, number 111 in the nation. Florida's pass offense, number one in the nation. But there is hope. Here in 1997, LSU found a way to beat the Mighty Gators when they were number one. And today, over 90,000 fans will cram into Tiger Stadium looking for that same kind of magic. Now let's go out to Tucson and Shelly Smith. The eighth-ranked Oregon Ducks will try tonight to prove that they're worthy of that ranking in a very tough road test here at Arizona Stadium against the Wildcats. How tough? Consider this. Five of the last seven games between these two teams were decided by seven points or less. Chris? Much more on both those games coming up. Meanwhile, the backdrop and the buildup for this game certainly do. This rich legacy proud, both unbeaten in the top five. It's been a generation since the game's had this much meaning. There's been gamesmanship. Stoops and Brown, it's not exactly Switzer and Royal, but Bob and Carol, 
Mack and Sally not really exchanging Christmas cards. You know, Brown has said Texas was complacent last year. Stoop says that is ridiculous. And he says despite the Sooners 17 game win streak, the pressure is on Texas. You know what? He might be right. Steve Cyphers, we know the game 364 days ago certainly spices things up today. Chris, you can't talk about this year's game without mentioning last year's blowout by Oklahoma. Texas today says they put that one behind them, which isn't to say they still don't remember. Last year, you know, was an emotional loss. It was an embarrassment. Well, who wouldn't be? Uh, she's 3 to 14 is not something that most people are used to. I didn't think they ran it up. No, I really didn't. Um, you know, they whooped our butts. I've only had two teams that got embarrassed like that since I've been a head coach in 18 years. So uh, it's not a good thing. It's not a fun thing. Sometimes the things just go, you know, one team's way. And last year, you know, we got a lot of breaks go our way. And, we, you know, we prepared really well for that game. We're not going out there to get revenge. I mean, this is a totally different team. It's a totally different ball game now. I mean, it's we got different players on the field. You know, you've, there's players that have matured more. and. So it's just a totally different game. Guys don't need revenge for this game. It's third and the fifth team in the country. It's Texas OU. It's national TV. Everybody knows about this rivalry. It just didn't start this year. It just didn't start last year. You know, it's Texas versus OU. Forget number three, number five. You know, we got to go out there and fight with them because, you know, they're going to come out, you know, trying to kill us. And, you know, we got to be out there ready to go down and, you know, play hard. Clearly, both schools are talking the same game going into this one, Chris. However, there is a difference. In Norman, it's the OU-Texas game. In Austin, it's Texas OU. Well, Steve, here's some numbers that aren't really ambiguous. Look how efficient Texas has been inside the red zone. 18 touchdowns, 21 scores in 23 trips. First and goal, they're 16 out of 17 with touchdowns, 12 on the ground, 4 in the air. They are producing fewer big plays than last year's offense at this point, Kirk. It's funny, it's like a far cry from the old time meetings. These teams used to combine for five or six completions. <laughs> you know, times have changed, but if you really look at this game, everybody wants to talk about the wide receivers. I think it comes down to the two teams and their ability to run the football. Look at Oklahoma. Last year, Quentin Griffin, he torched the horns with six touchdowns. He needs to come out and have a big game. Kansas State shut him down last week and it disrupted the timing of Oklahoma's offense. It's crucial for him to play well. And then for Texas, they've committed to the power running game of Ivan Williams. Kind of takes some of the pressure off of Chris Sims. I'm going to say right now, whoever runs the football better today wins this football game. Good point. Good point, Kirk. Let me tell you something. Last week, Kansas State's game against Oklahoma was a perfect example how Oklahoma wins football games. Their defense gave up 446 yards and 37 points. Their offense had nine yards rushing. They scored on a fumble recovery, a fake off a punt, and two long passes. Oklahoma finds ways to win football games. And let me tell you something. Oklahoma is the best prepared, cool under pressure team I've seen in a long time. And if Texas is going to beat these guys, they're going to have to bring their A game and a lot of heart to beat Oklahoma. The pep talk continues. <laughs> now you're right. Oklahoma's yeah. proven that. Texas has not yet proven it, but they could today. And revenge? Oh, no. Revenge is no factor. Who's thinking about last year? We'll talk to Chris Sims. We'll focus on him as well as Quentin Griffin. Revisit Northwestern's miracle from last weekend and profile a record-breaking running back you have not seen much of. Adrian Peterson. A lot more coming up from Dallas after this. Today's show is presented by Discover Car, proud to be the sponsor of College Game Day, and in part by Tostito Scoops, the tip lover's chip. Tell me about two million folks rides right every year here at the Texas State Fair. Big Ten football on ESPN, Iowa-Purdue following us at Northwestern and Ohio State, the game Kirk talked about in prime time. We'll talk much more about both those games coming up on ESPN2. Hokies on upset alert in Morgantown, and Mississippi State needs to get the first SEC win. They'll take on Auburn. Now, among today's sure things, Adrian Peterson will exceed 100 yards rushing against Western Carolina. The star of 1AA Georgia Southern has done that in all 47 of his career games, including 1AA playoff games. That's 35 straight regular season games. Now, Peterson is kind of a small-town Florida guy. His brother Mike played linebacker for the Gators, now with the Indianapolis Colts. He's a 212-pound fullback with excellent power and balance. He's an NFL prospect being pushed for the Heisman by Georgia Southern. 
But as Jay Billis reports, AP retains all of his natural humility as he keeps running for records. Adrian Peterson is taking care of things right now. He's pretty much a superstar on our team, and, but uh, he, uh, he doesn't act like it. Peterson to the 30. He's still on his feet. You know, with all the accolades he's received and, and all the things he's done, he's still probably uh, the most coachable kid we have on the football team. Peterson still on his feet. Peterson down to the 10. Oh, my. I tell him, he's the man. He's the man. He hates that because he don't want to get separated from the team. You know, he wants to be considered just like everybody else. But Adrian Peterson is not like everyone else. He's the all-time leading rusher in Division I AA. And with 100 yards this weekend, Peterson will break the NCAA All-Divisions record for most career 100-yard games with 36. He's still making the runs and doing plays. That after three years, I'm still amazed by seeing what he's doing. When he gets the ball, he thinks he's supposed to score every time. And if he doesn't, he gets upset. A lot of times when I get tackled by one guy, I'm, I'm very upset, you know. I feel like I worked so hard during the offseason that one person, Jim Tim Bears, to stop me from getting in the end zone. I just, just, just see that as something that I'm, that I'm supposed to do. Adrian Peterson has overcome almost every obstacle on the football field. But off the field, he's been battling a stuttering problem since the age of seven, a problem he's overcoming in All-America fashion. Never one to retreat from a challenge, Peterson voluntarily enrolled in a public speaking course at Georgia Southern, one that required seven speeches in front of the entire class, and he earned a B. Even though I, I stutter, it, it, it makes me work harder. You know, it's a challenge, and I think everybody needs, needs a little challenge in their life. He's got the best attitude of any person I've ever worked with. He is very accepting of who he is, and has always seen his speech, his stuttering, as part of him. What's harder, going against a nine-man defensive front or the first speech you gave in that class? You get given the speech probably because football just comes, you know. I mean, I work hard in the season, but once I get on the field, I feel like I'm at home. Here in the crowd, cheering, and then once you get the ball, just silent. Just like, like this, poetry without someone speaking. What does this record mean to you? It, it just shows that that I, I have great teammates, I guess. Cause I mean, all those guys come out and and play hard every Saturday, and some of them don't get like as much attention that they should. I think it's important to to our school and fans and our football team. Uh, it probably more important to them than it is to Adrian. In all honesty, I'm just just just, just having fun with, just taking it in stride. I'm not getting too overwhelmed by it. You know, just trying to, to, uh, to stay focused. Well, for now, AP and RJ Bowers share the All Division record for consecutive 100-yard games in the regular season, ahead of Dorsett and Griffin. Who can forget Damian Bean of Shepherd? Those 34 straight. So AP has missed. 24 fourth quarters in his career because Georgia Southern keeps winning blowouts, so that yardage total would have been bigger. All right, the uh, Joe Paterno win watch continues as the Wolverines come into Unhappy Valley. And fresh off the miracle win over the Spartans, Northwestern looks to kick it tonight in the shoe against the Buckeyes. We'll talk Big Ten shortly from Dallas. Welcome back to Dallas. A pregame traffic report. Oh, heavy congestion on I-35 headed here to the state fairgrounds. You want to be careful in the left lane there. All right, let's flash back quickly to a miracle last week in Evanston. Herb Hager at the senior fields it at the 15 across the 20. 25-30. Got some room. Dancing to the outside. Oh, no. 40. 35. 30. 35. 20. 25. 10. 5. Touchdown, Herb Hager. Are you kidding me? Kustak rolls to the near side. Well, heave it way downfield. Kunle Patrick runs under a tip. Troyer caught it. Troyer caught it at the 33. The snap is good. The hold is good. The kick is good. Good. David Wazulowski hits the field goal. Northwestern storms under the field. The Wildcats win 27-26. You need any more proof that Zach Kusak is a special kind of player that makes 10 other guys in the huddle better? Yeah. Kind of contagious confidence in Moxie. Opponents just try to take away Anderson and dare Kusak to beat them. He's rushing for 71 yards a game, 4.8 per carry, the same as Anderson. But tonight, Northwestern's nemesis. They're 0 for 21 against the Buckeyes since 72. 
have to cope with a crowd that's going to be a lot bigger than the crowd at the first three Northwestern games combined. They also have to cope with probably the Big Ten's best defense in Ohio State and a lowly Buckeye offense beginning to show signs of life against that bad Indiana team. Very good. Now, Indiana's not that bad. Now, last week <laughs> against Ohio, and Ohio State put together a package that could win them a lot of games and have a great season. They ran the ball with ball control. They had the ball for 35 minutes. Indiana had it for 25 minutes. And they used special teams to beat the Hoosiers. Now, number 30, true freshman Lydell Ross, 124 yards, two touchdowns. He's now the number one running back. Punter Anthony Groom, 42-yard kicking average, but here's what he did also. He downed this one on the four, helped the defense. And last but not least, Josh Houston, the field goal kicker, kicked two field goals to help them win. Now, Kirk, when you take a look at the Ohio State game against UCLA, and UCLA now, as good as they are, I'm telling you, that 13-6 loss in California is impressive. I like the Buckeyes to win this one the old-fashioned way. And Lydell Ross is going to be a special back. Oh, You're right about that. And the special teams have been good for Ohio State. Let's look at Northwestern. Nobody talks about spread offenses anymore in college football. Northwestern has their own version of the spread. They're going to spread you out with formations, get your defense to spread out. Then they're going to run Zach Kustak and Damian Anderson. Ohio State's going to try to negate that, take away Northwestern's ability to run the ball, force the Cats to throw to win the game. As Chris and Lee mentioned last week against Indiana, Ohio State kind of got a dress rehearsal. There's a shotgun formation. They're going to see that all night tonight. And there is an athletic quarterback. Mike Doss is a key. He's got to be able to come up and help out a run support to slow down Zach Kustak's ability. And I think Northwestern's wide receivers are going to have to make some plays in the passing game to give the Cats a chance. The fact that it's at night and it's in Ohio Stadium. We'll have the locals in a frenzy. And I think the home crowd will get that defense excited. I think the defense will win this game for Ohio State. Buckeyes offense in the Big Ten is number one in one category. Time of possession. That can be important against Northwestern. Is this a painful game for Notre Dame fans to watch, by the way? Ross gave a verbal commitment to Notre Dame. He's going to be. Stock, he is. transferred from Notre, Notre Dame. Dame. You're right. Oh. Irish fans, you can look in tonight. It should be a lot of fun for everybody, though. Wildcats, Buckeyes, 745 on ESPN. Well, now to Joe Paterno's win watch. It's crack number four at 323. Lions finally showed some spunk, but a moral victory at Iowa, not what he's really looking for, and Michigan's going to show no mercy. Lloyd Carr prohibited his team from talking about Penn State's early season plight. Lions are dead last in just about every offensive category in the Big Ten. They give up five sacks a game. They convert less than 30% of their third down. So we could go on and on. But why? We don't need to. <laughs> now they get to the tough part of that right. conference schedule. Paterno says no trouble with recruiting, but you disagree. I disagree, Glenn. Uh, 100%. Now, Joe Paterno's record is 6-13 and 13 in his last 19 games. He's the same guy that won 77% of his games and 322 in his career. In my opinion, Joe Paterno is still active. He's still sharp, he's still alert, and he still works well with his football team. He's a tremendous football coach, period. So what's the problem? Talent. Now, here's the problem. Penn State staff has made some mistakes in the selection and evaluation of their high school players. Poor job. And number two, the Penn State staff used to get all the good football players. They would gather them in instead of recruiting. Forget about it. Those days are over. But let me tell you something, folks. Don't put a fork in Paterno or <laughs> Penn State yet. I mean, they're injured, Jeez. but they're uh, not dead. Watch Paterno's. He'll be back. They're ready. They're ready to get their two or three wins this year. I think they have too <laughs> many thick ankles on that team. They can't run. It's the thing that slowed them down. How about Michigan? You talk about recruiting. They lost seven superstars off their offense, four of the five offensive linemen. The quarterback, Drew Henson, they're averaging an identical 33 points a game, just like they did at this time last year already. A big part of that has been to play the new quarterback, John Navarre. Big quarterback, classic drop back. I, again, he reminds me of a Todd Collins for an Elvis Gerback, and he has a great receiver in Marquise Walker. Watch him sit back in the pocket and look downfield. Vintage Michigan offense, move around, find the open man. Bellamy makes the big catch down the field. I think Penn State's woes will continue today. The combination of the running of P.J. Askew, the throwing, John Navarre to Marquise Walker, way too much. Lopsided win. Michigan rolls today over Penn State. Thick ankles. Yeah, thick right. ankles. He said that. Mark it down. He said that. Can't really put they're the running, ankles on a diet. Yes, they're running in sand right now. Got to We've got a lot more from Dallas. We'll visit with Chris Sims and Quentin Griffin. And when we come back to the state playground, we'll take a look back at the rich history of these classics over the years.
ESPN Classic Tradition is brought to you by Tostito Scoops, the dip lover's chip. As game day adds Texas OU to the list of great rivalries we visited, Ohio State, Michigan, Auburn, Alabama, Florida, Florida State, among others, we posed the question to various players and coaches, which of all the college rivalries is the best? Texas, Texas a and I think, uh, you know, you can't beat that. Football in Texas is such a big deal, and, you know, it's a lot of Texas high school players playing against each other, and it just means a lot of the whole state. Ohio State, Michigan. You know, Woody Hayes, Bo Schembechler, that, that's what it was all about, Ohio State, Michigan, the game. We like the Apple Cup, Washington, Washington State, but uh, uh, Army, Navy is, is always a, a great one as far as I was concerned watching it. Florida, Florida State, um, two big powerhouses like that located in the same state. You win, and, and for that year you feel, okay, these are my stomping grounds. I love playing Duke, love playing State, but there's nothing like South Carolina versus Clemson. The whole state, you're either a Clemson Tiger or you're a Gamecock, and there's nothing in between. I mean, that's what college football is about. A good national sampling. Now, this rivalry actually predates Oklahoma statehood by seven years. They first met here in Dallas in 1912. Both teams arrived after the scheduled kickoff. It's some problems with trains and automobiles. Over the years, there's been some bad blood, some feuds. Darrell Royal accusing Barry Switzer of sending a spy to a Texas practice. I'll tell you, a quarter century later, there is still some bad blood on that issue. With both sides finally back in the national championship hunt, we picked just two of the many high-impact classics in this great rivalry. It's going to be like two Mack trucks running into each other for three hours and 15 minutes out on the field because of the pride of these two places and what this game really means. Well, there was one thing that was certain about that game, that we were going to all get bruised. We were all going to be sore on Monday. Said so the only thing in doubt was who was going to win. And that's the way all of those games have been. The Oklahoma-Texas series has featured many classics among the first 95 meetings. The 63 edition was billed as the game of the century, as the top-ranked Sooners faced the second-ranked Longhorns. They were ranked up there all the time, and had been for a long time. When we got up in the rankings close uh, to them, it, it made it a, a, a lot bigger contest. The game provided proof that one versus two matchups don't always pan out. The Texas wishbone had the Sooner defense on its heels all afternoon. Duke Carlisle and Tommy Ford each ran for first half touchdowns as the Longhorns built a 14-zip halftime lead. The Texas defense was led by David McWilliams and All-American Scott Appleton, whose 18 tackles helped lead UT to a 28-7 victory. Eleven years later, it was a battle of the wishbones that wasn't even on TV due to the Sooners' probation. Number two Oklahoma was a 20-point favorite over the fifth-ranked Longhorns and their freshman back, Earl Campbell. The teams combined for just five completed passes as OU's Joe Washington ran for 122 yards. But it was Austin native Bill Brooks scoring on an end around for the Sooners to tie the game in the fourth quarter. OU's D took over from there. We had good players. We had good defensive players. The Selman brothers, uh, Elrod, uh, Randy Hughes, Rod Schult, uh, just great players on defense. It's hard to move the football and score on us. The Sooners prevailed in the 16-13 squeaker, their only single-digit win en route to the national title. I was raised on Boomer Sooner, and when it comes my time to go, I'll go out with the eyes of Texas. Like I said, strong feelings when Texas and Oklahoma both yeah. in the national title hunt. All is Woo. right in the college football universe. Time now for our questions from the folks. We've been wandering the fairgrounds trying to see what's on folks' minds. Here is question number one. My name's Carlos Garcia. I was wondering why, the, why is the SEC and the Big 12 so much stronger than the Big 10? All right, three words. <laughs> speed, speed, speed. The SEC and the Big 12 recruit the speed states. California, Texas, and Florida better than the Big 10, and it can outrun them. Don't forget about the Pac-10 as well. A lot of speed in the Pac-10. Yeah. All right. It's just a cyclical thing, though, you say. Big 10 coming back Big 10. No, 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 no. I forget think. it. No. no like never? No. No, not forever. never, but they forget about it. They don't can't run. <laughs> Question number two. Hi, this is TW from Tampa, Florida. Uh, Kirk, who do, how do you think Florida would stack up against Oklahoma or Texas? Well, you know, that's a great question. You look at these teams right now, we're going to learn a lot in the next couple weeks about all of them. But 
I think athletically they're very similar. There's one big difference between Florida and these two teams today. Quarterback. Rex Grossman brings experience. He's spreading the ball over the field, and that's what separates Florida. I think Miami of Florida and the Florida Gators right now are playing like the two best teams in college football. Oh, you, you would get oh. Grossman over the edge against Sims in a quarterback match. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right now, no yeah. question. Yeah. Big time. Right. Question number three. My name is Sarah McCord, and I'm an OU Sooner, and I just want to know how Lee Corso feels about not picking the winning team last week. Oh, oh I didn't pick right. the winning team. Who did I pick last week? I think I picked Oklahoma. No, 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 so Kansas no, State. No, oh, no, no, there it is, right there. there. Oh, <laughs> well, sorry, I was wrong. But you've gone against OU a few times. That's what they want to know. Is it a personal thing? Or? Absolutely not. I don't have anything against Oklahoma. Just because my son went to Texas Law School, why would I be worried about Oklahoma? <laughs> It's nothing personal. We had, a, we, personal. we had a little thick ankle. We had a lot going on there this week. We appreciate all the questions. If you want to ask Kirk or the coach questions, you can send them to ESPN.com and the great Americans at ESPN.com will help you. These guys will personally answer the questions. Last week, we enjoyed the inside access with LSU as they get ready for Tennessee. We'll show you how they fared after the bus arrived at Neyland Stadium and look ahead of today's game with the Gators. We'll look SEC coming up. All the folks here in the fairgrounds interested in sidelines. It's behind the scenes in Texas A&M football, Monday, 7 Eastern, Thursday, midnight. The first episode, some great moments there on the campus as they sold the red, white, and blue T-shirts to raise money for victims of the attack. Meanwhile, inside access at LSU last week showed you the buildup for the big road game at Tennessee. Now we'll go behind the closed doors of the locker room, get a good taste of the Tigers trying to talk themselves into winning a big road game, and coming up short and this might surprise you quickly mentally regrouping for the visit today by number two Florida warning though the inner sanctum is not a place for the faint of heart I'm going to lift my leg and do what the dogs do. Been 21 days. Territory. LSU. To you. All right, let's go. Hunter stretch. Right leg out. Ready, stretch. Let's go, baby. Oh, all night long. Go. Shuffle. Get it. Back. Come on, come on, come on. Tiger Jack T, ready? Begin. It's going down tonight, coach. Oh, yeah. It's going down tonight. It's going down tonight. No retreat, no surrender, baby. It's going down in here tonight. Oh, oh, get ready to play football. Oh, tonight. Tigers on three. One, two, three. Get it done. Don't worry about nothing. Don't worry about nothing. Let's get this party started. It's our house. If we give Snake, Road just looks at you, gives you Snake, boom, everybody else runs Smack. Now you gotta just send all your three of your receivers to take the Hail Mary here with five seconds. Tipped up, knocked down, incomplete. You gotta rebound and everybody gotta come together, man. You just saw what you made too many middle errors. Hey, we got Florida next week. We just gotta look at our film and look at the mistakes we made and come back out uh, better than we did this week. Guys, I'm proud of everybody's effort, and I want you to all keep your head up, uh, and I want you to all know that we're a team. I don't want anybody to be self-absorbed about what happened out here and how it affects you and how much you played and how bad you played or whatever. We're a team. We all win together. 
We all lose together, uh, and that's how it is. It's just a third game, baby. We got a whole season ahead of us, so keep your heads up. Tigers on three. One, two, three, Tigers! And once again, we thank LSU. You saw Rohan Davey, number six. Were you that kind of quarterback in the locker room? Yeah, to I like that, that guy's of... fired up. But not, not to that level. Rohan Davey yeah. will get you fired Woo. up, man. He can get you ready to play. I'd put him at linebacker. That guy can play <laughs> they, the game. They seem to take the loss pretty well. Maybe too well. I don't know. Yeah, we'll be, see. So... I don't know if Rex Gross for the floor is going to be giving a pep talk, but the Gators offense will be ready in Baton Rouge. We'll visit with old Rexy coming up. And also with Eric Crouch of Nebraska, big game in the Big 12 North as the Huskers host the Cyclones. A lot more from the Texas State Fairgrounds coming up. College Game Day is presented by Discover Card, proud sponsor of college football's premier pregame show. Well, thanks to a, a cotton candy schedule, Miami's computer ranking very low. Don't be alarmed, it's early, but Troy State's going to weaken it even more, Kirk. This, this is Miami's last tune-up before next week's game in Florida State. The thing I love about Miami's offense, the balance. There's the best-looking tight end in college football, Jeremy Shockey. Dorsey spreads the ball around, completing 62% of his passes. And Clinton Portis is running like a madman this year, averaging 6.3 yards a carry. The Canes look very good right now. Well, the Trojans played Nebraska within four touchdowns. Now Nebraska has the fifth of eight home games against Iowa State. Hard to conceive of a Cyclones win in Lincoln. That's because none of the players had been conceived the last time it happened back in 1977. Solich says this is his best opponent so far. And I guess it's hard for Notre Dame fans to argue. Ennis Haywood going to be another 1,000-yard rusher, but the story for Iowa State has been quarterback play. Seneca Wallace... Recruited as a DB by Oregon State, went to Sacramento City Junior College. He comes to Iowa State in his third major college game, 18 straight completions. That's a conference record. Kirk, he was 22 out of 24. He had four touchdowns, but he's not quite seen a defense at Sacramento City or anywhere else quite as good as Nebraska's defense. No, you're right. The black shirt defense, they're, they're off to a great start, averaging only two yards per carry and allowing opponents to complete 41% of their passes. But today's going to be their toughest test. Chris mentioned it. The Cyclones bring in a balanced and versatile offense led by their quarterback, Seneca Wallace. He can do a lot of things. He has the ability to get to the outside and spread the ball around. You imagine hitting 18 straight and finishing 22 at 24. That tells you that he's not just an athlete running around making plays. He he has the ability to throw the football. Nebraska needs to be careful just to throw their jersey out there and expect to roll over Iowa State. I think the Cyclones could keep this game close. In fact, I think Seneca Wallace and the Cyclones offense will make some big plays, but of course, Nebraska That's will still win the game. That's a good pick. You know, the team that Nebraska's playing today is 12-3 and three in their last 15 games. And that's the best school record since 1911 to 1913. And they've won six straight. That's Iowa State. No kidding. Iowa State actually beat Nebraska in 1992 in Ames. This game is in Lincoln. Forget about it. Too many players, too many fans, too much red. Nebraska big. Marv Seiler heroics in that game. <laughs> now, Nebraska's defense gave up that six-yard touchdown drive to Notre Dame three games ago. Mm. Have not allowed a touchdown since. Wow. wow. But Kansas State cannot afford to fall two games behind the Huskers if they want the Big 12 South winner when they get back here to Dallas. Cats are very tough-minded. They haven't lost back-to-back -back regular season games since 94, but it did take a lot out of them, that me tough mm -hmm. mental and physical loss to Oklahoma. Colorado is a challenge, even though they've lost 13 of 14 versus top 20 teams. Barnett, 0 oh, 6. He's had many close calls there. The Buffs, if they don't self-destruct, have been tough since they lost to Fresno State with five turnovers. They're cutting way down on turnovers. Marcus Houston is healthy at running back, but a big blow for Colorado's defense. Jay Sean Sykes, their excellent linebacker, may be out for the season. Has a C3 problem in his vertebra. That's going to affect their defense. You know, but one of the toughest jobs a coach has got to do is bring a team back from a disappointing close loss that meant a big thing to him, like Kansas State, Oklahoma last week. That's a problem Bill Snyder has. But he also has another problem, Colorado. As we said, Colorado has lost to the highest-ranked FSU team, Fresno State, and they're a pretty good football team. L. Robertson, the quarterback, is the key for Kansas State's comeback. Now watch L. Robertson number three here when he lines up and throws a bomb right here. Perfect pass. What a sensational player. Now this is my favorite play of the Oklahoma game. Watch this young man run the triple option. Takes the ball, comes down line, freeze it right there. Look at that. He watches two guys take the pitch, and there goes Robertson for a touchdown again. Now Kansas State has won 58 straight games at home against unranked teams. 
Colorado is unranked. Yeah. Make it 59. You know what? I think we all saw the same thing last week. Oh. We all walked away from that game. You know, Oklahoma won, impressed with Kansas State. Overall defensive speed, and now having a quarterback like L. Roberson, who's been out there and been in the fire. His offensive coordinator, Ron Hudson, now goes from maybe being a little bit suspect with certain play calling. Now he's going to open things up because he's more confident because he's seen L. Roberson make plays under fire against a great defense on the road. I expect Kansas State to come back fired up, and I think this team's on their way back to Dallas. I think they're going to get to I think they're going to play for the Big 12 championship game. I really like Kansas State. Well, Snyder reminding his team after they lost to OU last year in the regular season, almost blew the next yeah, game sure home against Texas, Texas Tech. Tech. He's reminding him of that. Yeah. All right, back now to the glamour game with the glamour names and including one common name. So who is your favorite Roy Williams? Is he the guy who became New Zealand's premier decathlete back in the 60s? Maybe the influential swing trombonist in the 50s? Or the Roy Williams known as the Big Musketeer when he worked in the Mickey Mouse Club? And the Big 12, of course, you got Roy Williams, the great basketball coach at Kansas. But for the folks here in the fairground, it is today's Roy versus Roy matchup that's got him going. It's the freakish wide receiver at Texas, the very gifted safety at Oklahoma. So who's going to have the edge? Who's going to get to the Rose Bowl? Who's going to get to the Pro Bowl first? Yeah, both Roy Williams are that good. Interception, Oklahoma! And he makes an acrobatic catch! Guess who it was? Roy Williams! <laughs> a phenomenal athlete. Uh has a, a lot of youth, a lot of speed, has great hands. I think he's the best safety in the, uh, in the nation today. Just making those one-handed catches and just, you know, just flat out showing off. Last year he led, he started the game off with eight straight tackles, you know, against us, so I mean, he, he's a real deal. Roy Williams lowered the boom. He's almost a uh, safety in the linebacker's body. I mean, he has a size. But he has the speed. Roy can pretty much do whatever you ask him to do. He can hit. What a hit. He, he can bring the wood. Everything Roy do, he do hard. In my eyes, he's the best uh, Roy Williams there is out there. There goes Roy Williams. Look out. The greatest athlete I've ever been around. No question. He makes those catches that most people don't make. You know, he always has highlights every game. Touchdown! 97 yards! Unbelievable hands, Spider-Man hands. Can jump and just runs like a gazelle. Yeah, he's a freak. I, I call him a freak. The two Roy Williams in this game uh, may become more famous than the one coaching at Kansas. Roy Williams. I'm Roy. I'm the real Roy Williams. Uh, it's kind of funny. You know, I just wish that he was a corner so he could be Roy Williams against Roy Williams. So. Something about them Williams. I don't know. Well, today again, namesake, bragging rights at stake. No question that last year. Oklahoma's Roy Williams had the bragging rights, six tackles and a sack, broke up a pass, and Texas Roy Williams held to just four yards a catch on four receptions. We'll come back, we'll talk more in this game, and also on Casey Clawson and the balls at home against Georgia. And again, that game down at Baton Rouge with high-flying Rexy Grossman and the Mighty Gators offense. We'll visit Tony down at LSU coming up. Well, here in Dallas, a beautiful day. Clear, sunny, a little cool, a little breezy. Should be perfect football weather this afternoon for the Sooners and the Longhorns. Well, Tennessee, as we saw, paid back LSU. Next up, Georgia. Dogs held the balls to 10 first downs last year, broke a nine-game losing streak against them, and down came the goalposts. But last time Georgia won in Knoxville, Herschel Walker was a puff back in 1980. Dogs' young quarterback David Green says that yeah, there's a big crowd at Knoxville, but here's heard that Neyland Stadium is, quote, overrated. Huh? Huh? Well, he's young. <laughs> now, the Vols have not allowed a rushing touchdown this season, but they did give up a buck 94 in the fourth quarter once LSU went to the spread, and you know Mark Richt has taken notice of that. Back down to Baton Rouge. Les élèves en brûlé, Tony Barnhart. The Volunteers are a little bit banged up, and they're heading into a very tough stretch of the schedule. Well, Chris, there's no question that Tennessee looks a little vulnerable today. They're missing a couple of players, particularly Will Overstreet, that great defensive end. But you know what? Coach Philip Fulmer will have no part of this discussion. In fact, he challenged his players this week. He said, guys, no letdown, no excuses. Now, guys, believe it or not, this is Georgia's first game on the road this season. And with all respect to young David Green, Kirk, there's a reason the Vols have won 39 of their last 41 at home. I like Tennessee. 
Well, Tony, you know how tough they are at home. You also know that although Tennessee is unbeaten, ranked seventh in the country, the fans at Tennessee have been a little bit concerned about the offense and their young quarterback, Casey Clawson. Last week, he silenced his critics with a 300-yard game, mainly because of his superstar young wide receiver, the freshman Kelly Washington. Kelly Washington was all over the field. I think he's worth the preseason hype that he receives. Of course, well-known. He minor league baseball player who gave it up and now showing what he can do on the football field also has the ability to play quarterback but last week it was all receiver and this kid is big time look at the throw there by Clawson splitting the seam and the speed there by Washington kind of coasting his way in for a touchdown I think Georgia's defense will be tougher on Clawson and the Tennessee offense but I'll tell you what Tennessee I think gained a lot of confidence last week I think they're going to continue here I think they're too much Mark Rick's doing a great job at Georgia still a year or two away from competing with a team like Tennessee you like Tennessee I like Tennessee. Good pick. You know, Florida State's former offensive coordinator and first-year head coach Georgia, head coach Mark Rick, is smart enough to know to beat Tennessee on the road, you got to throw it, you got to throw it, and then you got to throw it some more because the Tennessee front seven is dangerous. And Georgia has the no-huddle offense and a quarterback named David Green that could possibly beat Tennessee. Now, David hit 28 of 34 last week, number 14, 298 yards and two touchdowns, and he loves to throw the ball to Terrence Edwards, who caught six for 122 yards. Now, Georgia will score. But Rocky Top beats them in the fourth quarter. Tough to beat Tennessee in Knoxville. You know, Georgia, Tennessee could have been Nate Hibble against Chris Sims. <laughs> Hibble transfer from That's Georgia. Right. Sims, of course, originally verbally committed to Tennessee before going to Texas. He said, of course, they'll play right here. Now, speaking of quarterback play, Florida's has been just outstanding. It's hard for even the old ball coach, Steve Spurrier, to find fault. The Gators are scoring touchdowns on almost half of their offensive possessions, 47%. That is astounding. The rest of the SEC averaging about 20%. And Tony, the trigger man, Rex Grossman, is a big reason. Well, there's no question about it, Chris. You know, to Florida fans, when you talk about quarterbacks, they figure they're never gonna see another one like Danny Werfel, the 1996 Heisman Trophy winner. But going into today's game with LSU, Rex Grossman, the sophomore, is the number one quarterback in the nation. And you know what? the Heisman voters are starting to notice. In Latin, the word Rex means king, and for Grossman, the crown is beginning to fit. I'm Rex Daniel Grossman III. He's the king of our offense. He makes everything go. Rex really means comfortable to this whole team. He's a baller. I mean, he's a gamer. He's a guy who has uh, great physical abilities. I mean, he can run, he can throw. Despite leading Florida to its first SEC championship since 1996, Grossman was locked in a battle with sophomore Brock Berlin going into preseason practice. In August, Coach Spurrier called his name. It was my goal to be the starting quarterback and, and to play all the snaps, so uh, to hear that, him say that I got my opportunity to prove that I could do that. The competition over the spring with Brock Berlin and himself, I uh, think it raised his level of play and is showing out down the field today. But Grossman's maturing process began last year. As a freshman, he led the SEC in passing efficiency and touchdowns, but it wasn't all smooth sailing for Rex. Last year, um, Auburn game, you know, I had five touchdowns in the first half, and I didn't really know. You know, it was, it was my second game starting, and I didn't know what was going on. I was a little caught in a little whirlwind there. And then the Georgia game, he just, I don't know if he was lost or what happened, but uh, we put Jesse in about the second quarter. I didn't play very well in the Georgia game after that. I don't know if there's a direct correlation to that, but um, this, this year I'm definitely just going to stay on a level plane and, and see what I can do. Last year he was, he might have heard a couple of things, maybe not have gotten to the best play. And right now, he's just doing everything the right way. He's not really worried about interceptions or worried about screwing up. He's just, he's just out there playing and having a good time. And, and uh, you know, I think that everything's kind of coming together and gelling for him. With 1,400 yards passing and 15 touchdowns in four games, Grossman is drawing comparisons to Florida's favorite son, 1996 Heisman Trophy winner Danny Werfel. In fact, Grossman's numbers are well ahead of Werfel's Heisman winning pace. But nobody in Gainesville, especially Grossman, is ready to discuss the H word. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, I'm the best football player in the nation, but, you know, there's, uh, 
it's just an awkward, uh, awkward situation right now with, the, with so many good players on our team that, that could be in that, that stature that aren't getting that uh, recognition. I think Rich has the potential to be just as good or better than Danny Wilford was. Uh, and then he has some good receivers behind him backing him up to help him with his campaign to be the best he can be. And uh, I think that, yeah, you know, I think he'd go out there and be better than anybody that's ever been. Well, now, Rex is, uh, he doesn't have it all down the way everybody wants to tell him right now. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to be critical. Coach Spurrier definitely, you know, quotes uh, Benjamin Franklin all the time saying that, uh, you know, yeah, you show me a satisfied man, and I'll show you a failure. Now, with Grossman having such a big year, Florida fans are beginning to wonder about the future of Brock Berlin. Now, he's from Shreveport, just about three hours from here, and this was really supposed to be a big homecoming for him. For now, he says he's going to wait, be patient, and see what happens. But, Kirk, I tell you what, if Grossman keeps playing like this, he may have to wait an awfully long time. Uh, incredible start so far for Rex Grossman. I have some numbers here. If he continues at this rate, he ended up throwing for over 4,200 yards and 45 touchdown passes in one year. But let, let's not get carried away. I, I talked to Steve Spurrier earlier this week, and he said one of the things that he's doing a better job of is he's seeing the field, making better decisions. But he said, to be quite honest, we're protecting him. And we said, we protect Rex Grossman. He has the arm strength and a quick release to make defenses pay. And that's what we've seen so far this year. He sits back in the pocket, and he has great receivers. It's not just Jabbar Gaffney. He also can throw it to a number of other guys who can go up and make a, uh, make a play. Taylor Jacobs, Rache Caldwell can also run the football. But look at the arm strength and the vision downfield. He doesn't put himself in a bad position. And I think in this game, you're going to continue to see Rex Grossman throw the football. And I think with the injuries in the secondary at LSU, they're going to overcompensate with Rex Grossman. Look for the Gators to have success running the ball, too. I think Florida wins big today. That he did I in return. I don't have enough time right now. Let me tell you, the entire nation <laughs> is talking about the pass offense of Florida. They deserve it. They've averaged 50 points a game, but they can play defense, and they got some great defensive football players. And I think if they're going to go to the Rose Bowl, they're going to have to play good defense. Kennard Ellis, number 35, is the leader of that defense. Good sack right there. Dennis, I mean, uh, defensive coordinator John Hoke is doing a tremendous job. Here's one alarming stat if you're an LSU fan. Mm. LSU's pass defense, 111 out of 115. Florida's pass offense, one. Uh-oh. That's trouble. Well, what, what is Spurrier's complaint about Grossman? He's not scrambling well, enough. Right. Or He's not going forward, forward enough. You've got to cover those fumbles, too. Oh. You've got to work on that. And he, he missed a read in the Marshall yes. game. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Reed back ago. there. Right. South Carolina, any trouble with Kentucky in the SEC? No, I don't no. think so. Zero no. trouble. No, no. Holtz is talking up Kentucky, but the, you say they low line. We'll talk almost exclusively Texas OU coming up. neutral field game. Dallas is actually closer to Norman than Austin, but it's still very much in the state of Texas. But it's always a compelling subplot for this game, recruiting the lifeblood of any program, especially important, the fertile territory in Texas. 132 native Texans on these two rosters. Over the decades, Oklahoma has won many important recruiting duels, and that's been much of the disgust of Texas coaches. Darrell Royal compared it to cattle rustling, and that's a serious crime. If there's one position where Sooners have used Texans to beat Texas, it's running back. Greg Pruitt, Joe Washington, Billy Sims, and another Texan did the damage last year, although there's one difference. He was not a big-time recruit, Steve. Chris, his name is Quentin Griffin, and though he might have been overlooked by a number of football programs, he wasn't overlooked by his Oklahoma teammates. He started on the scout team playing offense, and that's when the defense noticed. One of the happiest defensive days in Corey Heineke's Oklahoma life came the day Quentin Griffin was taken off the scout team two years ago. He caused a lot of headaches, for sure, because you just couldn't, you couldn't, he's so quick and you can get off this far off the ground and it, you, there's nothing you can do about it. It was unbelievable and the first thing everybody thought was, you know, I like how he said Barry Sanders a little bit. I mean, no matter how good of a player you are, no matter how good of a tackler you are, you know, I mean, you're still going to have problems with it. Danny breaks tackle. Wow. Oh, man. Who knows that better than Texas? 
When the game a year ago began, the one they called Q was a Big 12 secret. When it was over, it was national news. Six touchdowns for Quentin Griffin. One year later, the record-setting day still looks good on tape. We all sit there and just rewind it over and over, because he just buckles people's legs, and he's just got that certain wiggle that you don't see every day. Unless you're a Sooner. Unless you're Bob Stoops and you recruited the 5'6 Houston native when so many other programs, including the Longhorns, didn't. We loved what we saw on tape. A guy that made plays, made people miss him, caught the ball well, ran the ball well, did everything that we looked for. He is the perfect back. He has a great gift for starting and stopping. He's short. He's not little by any means. He's stout. You see him in the weight room, it's unbelievable. He squats the world. He'll stick his nose in there and pick up a stunt linebacker with the best of them. I think what motivates Quentin is his individual pride. Uh, he, he has great pride that he does everything right, um, you know, and, and it really aggravates him if he doesn't. His will is very strong, and nobody could break that. For the second straight year, Griffin, all Big 12 last season, leads the Sooners in rushing and receiving. Against Air Force, he ran for a career-high 201 yards. But chances are, you'll never hear it from him. He isn't much for the limelight, isn't much for, for being very boastful at all. He's the most humble guy you'll know. Quentin's a very shy, uh, unassuming guy. He'll probably say what's up, but he'll go on about his business. He lives in his own little world. What kind of world is it, from what you can tell? I have no clue. Q's kind of guy that, <laughs> you know, even when you get to know him, you, do, you, don't, you don't really get to know him. I think the most uh, he's ever said at one time is, when uh, Coach asked him to bless the food for the <laughs> pre-game meal, we knew we were going to eat real quick. So, <laughs> When was the last time you had to tell Quinn to be quiet in the huddle? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. I, you know, he, the day that happens, <laughs> what will you think? I don't know. I'll think, you know, maybe he got knocked loose on the last play or something. Not likely, because to knock him loose, to hit him square, you'd have to catch him first. And seldom does Griffin give defenders, or for that matter, reporters, such a shot. What a run! So, Chris, maybe you noticed we didn't hear from Griffin in that story. Here's the deal on Quentin. He doesn't like doing interviews. He is that shy. He is that timid. He doesn't have a blanket policy turning them down. He will talk to reporters after the game, but by and large, he avoids them like he does tacklers whenever he can. He does a great job hiding on the field, too, oh, yeah. until he finds the end zone. Now, Oklahoma has that Governor's Cup and the Golden Hat, a lot of trophies in this game, because they scored the first five times they had the football last year. And really, with that game in mind, Texas kind of tweaked their defensive formations and, and their secondary. Chris, they better. <laughs> you know, there's a memo, an open memo to defensive coordinator from Texas, Carl Reese. I've seen Oklahoma play six times live and in color. And in every single game, and I don't care who it is, Florida State, Kansas State, Nebraska, they destroy the defensive secondary when they send an all-out blitz trying to get the Oklahoma quarterback. If you don't believe me, watch these two plays from last weekend. Number six, Antoine Savage. One-on-one, -on -one, goodbye, sweetheart. It is gone. Now, just to prove it, I'm not stupid. Watch this one. They send the blitz. Antoine Savage, gone. Touchdown. Now, to beat Oklahoma's offense, I think you got to stop Quentin Griffin, number one. Number two, you got to play an umbrella defense. Keep everything inside of you. When those receivers get it, boom, bang them and make them drop the football. Make them drive the football to beat you, Oklahoma. Now, you're right. Thanks for proving that. Though. You cleared that up there. <laughs> you know, this is a different Texas defense than they were a year ago. They're more experienced. They're stronger, and they're a little bit more disciplined. And it's funny, when you talk to every single Texas defensive player, you say, what's the key to the game? They say, containing Quentin Griffin. So we're all on to something here. Obviously, you got to take him out of the football game and try to slow him down. They've been flirting with a new scheme. Look for Derek Johnson. I think this guy's the best true freshman in college football on the defensive side of the ball. D.D. Lewis also is an experienced senior. They'll put both of these guys in there. Look at the speed of Johnson. Watch him today, number 11. Another key in this game today, Coach is right. You want to play an umbrella defense, but at the same time, you want to put pressure on Nate Hibble. Look at last week's game. Nate Hibble probably had to take more Advil on Sunday and Monday just to get ready for practice on Tuesday. Texas will come after him and come after him a lot. Will they be able to put that pressure with the blitz 
Or can they do it with just the front four? Yeah, we'll see. You're right, though. With that scheme, there's tremendous pressure on Oklahoma's wide receivers to make spectacular yes. catches yes. every game. We'll shift the focus to when Texas has the football. When we come back, Chris Sims has been ripping up Houston and Texas Tech, but this is a whole new ball game today. And of the Pac-10, Oregon travels to Arizona. Joey Harrington trying to get the Ducks uh, going early for a change. keep asking us besides who do you like it's a, have you had a corny dog yet that's not a corny dog but you can do some good eating here try that corny dog but oregon is kind of tasting life in the top 10 with very high expectations a 4-0 start less than satisfying the ducks fans because they've been starting slowly and not dominating and surviving with takeaways not dominant defense it's a good thing they're america's most clutch team game decided by a touchdown or less they've won the last seven but they take on Arizona, and last year it was a defensive struggle. Tonight, it's their first Pac-10 road game. Both starting wide receivers are ailing. Jason Willis, Keenan Howery will play, but they're not 100%. They go back to Tucson now and Shelly Smith. Shelly? Chris, when these two teams met last year, it proved to be a very critical point in both of their seasons. Oregon won the game 14-10 to 10 and went on to share the Pac-10 championship. Arizona, on the other hand, didn't win a game the rest of the season. Tonight's game could be just as critical, and both teams know it. The Arizona-Oregon rivalry is, is a huge one. It always seems like there's a, a tremendous emotion uh, involved in that game, and I, I'm not sure why exactly. Uh, not that I don't understand it, but it's, it's Pac-10 and the pride thing, and certainly we want to continue to be in the race for this Pac-10 championship and ultimately whatever can occur afterwards, and I know Arizona wants to come, climb right back into it. I think Arizona is gunning for us, especially the last couple years. We, we've come in as a ranked team. Um, into their house a couple a couple years ago when we were ranked and they came up to us trying to make a point last year and uh, I think it's just the situation they, they're a very tough defense a very uh, you know, they, they pride themselves on their program on their defense and uh, I think they've tried to make it a point of shutting down our, our offense which has kind of been our calling card there's a nice little love-hate relationship we love to play but we really don't like them that much and um, they're just really good team you got everyone both teams got really well uh, good skill players and you know, good offense and defense alignment and just good athletes all around. We just like to get after each other. Now, Joey Harrington has brought the Ducks back from a fourth quarter deficit eight times in the last three seasons. And guys, he may have to do it again tonight because Arizona is limiting opposing rushers to a league low 2.7 yard average. Kirk? Well, Shelly, teams that uh, have faced Oregon this year are throwing the ball. That's how they're attacking. They're going through the air. You look at the four games they've played, teams have averaged 43 passing attempts per game over 318 yards. I'll tell you, that's the key to this game. Can Arizona throw the ball against Oregon? Last week, Jason Johnson threw four interceptions for Arizona against Washington State. He's got to play much, much better. I think Arizona at home will upset Oregon today. I like Arizona. Now that's Ooh. a big pick. I'll tell you what, it's, and it's a perfect spot for an upset because Oregon is undefeated for two reasons. Number one, they're very lucky, and number two, Jerry Harrington is winning fourth quarter rallies over Wisconsin and USC. Now their luck might run out against in the desert. But no, I don't think so. They were lucky enough to beat Texas last year. I think they're lucky enough <laughs> this time to beat Arizona by a field goal. Oh, little the touch, reference to the holiday little, ball. Little the touch. Ducks got him there. Yeah, they beat him. Here's You're an there. alarming stat, by the way. Oregon is 10 for 48 on third down. There's only two Ooh. teams worse than that, North Texas and Army. That's an amazing, amazing. stat That's for a top win. 10 team. Washington, their 11-game winning streak is on the line against USC at home. And Wazoo, positive surprise against Oregon State, the negative surprise of the country. What's up with the Beavers? Well, the, the Beavers are struggling. Look at their pass defense. Last year, they ended the year fourth in the country, and they had one of the best pass defenses in the country, 24 interceptions. This year, they're ninth in the Pac-10 in pass defense, and they don't have an interception yet. Washington State's going to try to exploit that today with their threat of passing the football. Jason Gesser, if you haven't heard of Jason Gesser, you need to watch the, the late show that we do because he's on every single week. Number 17, 12 touchdowns on the year, two interceptions. Mike Bush, a former basketball player, 16 points a game on the hard floor is very good. And there's the main man, Nicole McElrath. Washington State is for real with the passing of Jason Gesser. This continues. They win big today and brace themselves 
for an unlikely matchup next week with Stanford. Both teams are going to be undefeated. Stanford and Washington wow, State. That'd be a great game to see. Yeah. I tell you, what, speaking of Washington State, let's take a look at Washington. Their problem at the beginning of the year was Corey Pickett, their quarterback, but he's been sensational. He's only had one interception in the last 75 attempts. But there's one good thing about this. Check this stat. This is amazing. Rick Neusheisel has won 20 football games at Washington. 15 of them have come from behind. That's a sign of a tremendous football coach and a poised team. I think Washington wins this one also. They, good thing they're at home. They are oh, nicked yeah. up. Marcus Tuiasasopo's little brother makes his first career start at linebacker because the Huskies are shorthanded. But USC is the worst running team yeah. in the Pac-10. Next week, Huskies against UCLA, by the way. When we come back, we'll get back to Texas OU and hear from Chris Sims. This is the kind of day where quarterback legacies are made and redemption can be earned. Sponsor of the 2002 Outback Bowl. One of the many number one jerseys you'll see in Burn Orange. Well, it's sad but probably true that around the country more fans root for Chris Sims to fail rather than succeed. It's a byproduct of all that talent, the hype, the looks, and the myth, the myth that he overcame a popular starting quarterback because of his last name. Early in his career, Chris did give his critics some ammunition. He struggled, but he spent all season proving the doubters wrong. Only two picks in 129 attempts. Then again, as Curry Kirkpatrick reports, Chris grew up knowing full well that it's games like today's on which a quarterback's legacy is built. My name is Chris Sims. Chris Sims steps up, touchdown, Texas. You may have heard of me. Sims in stride, touchdown. And my dad. Sims, unbelievable. Chris Sims, son of Phil Sims, chose to play not only his dad's game, but his dad's position. And then he became a star. That added to the notoriety from the Northeast to the Southwest, both now and forevermore. That's never been a real big problem for me. Um, I've enjoyed growing up the way I did. He's sensitive about people thinking he might should play because of who his dad was, which is absurd. I mean, that's, I need to eat. I'm not going to play somebody because his dad's got a big name. How come your dad won't talk about you? It's just something that he really believes in, and, and uh, he's just going to let me play, and, and I guess he doesn't want to interfere. I call him a wimp, but, <laughs> but he's always tried to stay away from the spotlight, and he gets worried when I get too much. Um, you know, do you have to do this interview? He tries to be incognito, is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You think he's James Bond on a secret mission? <laughs> Wears a big hat, like, like pulls, pulls it down to here, puts a towel around his neck. But none of the efforts of Sims the Elder has lessened the attention on Sims the Younger. People believe I got too much hype, and, and uh, I'll be the first one to tell you that I probably, I definitely did. Somebody said, uh, what about the Heisman hype for you? And he said, I don't deserve it. I haven't done enough to be on that list. Here's seven guys that do. If Chris Sims wanted to escape the glare of the celebrity child spotlight, he sure didn't help the situation upon arrival in Austin. On the day freshmen checked into Jester dorm, Sims arrived in a limousine with uniform driver full wet bar the works. Immediately he was nicknamed Limo, and an onslaught of other names and ribbing hasn't stopped since. Every veteran of the team called me limo for the first five months I was here. <laughs> I call him the big blonde. I call him the golden child. The golden child, you know. I was teasing him about that. We call him Sims, we call him, you know, cover boy, you know, ESPN, call him SI, Sims Illustrated. They like to pick on me a little bit. Now, I feel like the guy. We know Chris is the guy to go to, you know, and uh, we know he's going to step up every week. And we know he's going to make plays. He is ten times better than he was this time last year. Uh, it's not even close in his development process. Still, several opponents have demeaned Sims, resulting in the Longhorn star, as they say in Texas, kicking butts and taking names. I'm making a list. Who's been on the list? Well, a few local writers around here, and the coach, coaches and players from Houston, and a few things were said, and, you know, Texas Tech. But it's all part of the game, and I kind of just have fun with it. He's never mentioned anything that, to me about that list. 
I want to look at it to make sure I'm not on or anything. <laughs> If somebody being critical of him motivates him, I'm going to try to find something every week and put that list in front of him. I hope it grows. Is Oklahoma on the list? Well, they're on the list around here, this whole city, <laughs> this weekend. Oh, kind of is the reason I came to a place like this. You know, we get to play OU up in Dallas, great rivalry. And, and uh, you know, we're both in the top five, and you couldn't ask for anything more. This is our time. Woo! All right. All right, he's, he's talking the talk. There's a lot of talent for Texas, though. He's got a huge offensive line in front of him, a couple of NFL prospects there, future NFL wide receivers, future NFL tight end. When Texas has the ball, Lee, against that Oklahoma defense with all that talent, we got some talent on the field. I mean, <laughs> and you, boy, you're not kidding. Oklahoma has some defensive talent. And if they have a weakness, Kansas State might have exposed it last week. The way to do it is you drive a receiver deep and you bring one underneath. Kansas State had three big plays in that area, and guess what? Texas has the same play in their playbook. Let's take a look at that. Number one, Chris Sims. Watch him come back and hit number four, Roy Williams, in that void area right in the middle, and there goes old Roy. Touchdown, Texas. Now, Texas is going to have to run the football and keep off balance. And I think they can do that. But remember also, they got one thing going for them. If Chris Sims gets nicked up, they got a guy named Major Applewhite sitting on the rack. And he could be a part of this big play. He could be, but I think Texas fans want to see Chris Sims finish it. Texas has found balance this year. They've gone to a power running game with Ivan Williams. If you look at Oklahoma, what they want to do, they want to try to make them one-dimensional and make Chris Sims make decisions in obvious passing situations. I talked to Mike Stoops, and he told me one of the biggest keys in this game is stopping the vertical seam route. It's hurt Kansas, It's hurt Oklahoma already this year. We saw it last week against Kansas State. You talk about it defense that made some mistakes and I think fatigue became a problem in the fourth quarter for Oklahoma as Kansas State split the seams and if they thought Kansas State had speed at receiver wait till they see B.J. Johnson and Roy Williams and company they've got to be able to get back look at the mental mistake here letting the receiver loose and Everidge has to come over those are mental mistakes that you didn't see from Oklahoma we could sit here and talk about X's and O's all day and what the key to the game is the bottom line for Oklahoma is they have not come out for four games defensively and played with the same intelligence and attitude that they played with last year if they don't today they're gonna lose so you say keep an eye on the number of snaps that Texas has the ball that's really yeah, yeah. important 80 yep. being the magic number. The number. The number special teams Oklahoma's punter and kick will probably have the edge but Texas yep. has excellent return guys overall special teams probably a wash a check in both categories predictions and more straight ahead from Dallas today's show is presented by discover car proud to be the sponsor of college game day and in part by Dell we never forget the spoilers the unbeatens in the non BCS conferences BYU took care of business last night Fresno State idle today, next at Colorado State, and Toledo against winless Ohio U. Iowa would like to get in the rankings, but they have to win on the road against Purdue. We're right back here for predictions, but now we go to West Lafayette in a preview of that game coming up on ESPN to Steve Levy. Steve? Chris, Joe Tiller showed up at work today, like many of us so often.